Welcome, everybody. Welcome to the Legendarium Podcast. This is uh, the Stone Sky, the third book in the Broken Earth trilogy. Uh, we are we have we have reached the end. We've reached the conclusion. I am Craig, your host, and over there he is Ryan. Hello, Ryan. Hello. No insult today, Ryan. I uh, just finished the book, so I didn't have time to insult you. How do you feel? Uh, I feel it's kind of odd because you usually come up can come up with them on the fly. So. Well, I mean, I. C- could but uh let's the book themed ones i understand the need to craft that's, <laughs> that's right and over on the other side of the room it's sarah welcome back sarah happy to be here you know we get a lot of comments about uh you know more sarah you're like the cowbell of the podcast people <laughs> just can't seem to get enough so, so flattered wow <laughs> so i'm uh, glad you're back um of course it's easy to schedule when it's your own wife so well that makes don't it make it sound i that makes it sound like i don't have a life i'm just hanging out like Anytime you want to do a podcast, sweetie, I'm free and easy. <laughs> and that is not the case. <laughs> I, I, uh, boy, uh, so many jokes. Uh, but I'll, I'll leave them alone. <laughs> As um, a wise man should. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Exactly. <laughs> There's some material for an insult if you need. So, uh, so the the Stone Sky. Very interested to talk about this book. Uh, and I know that there are plenty of people who are who have been interested in us getting to this point. Um, and so it has taken a while. We started fifth season. Gosh, it must have been three or four months ago um, when we did that More, episode. More, I feel like I feel like it's been <laughs> it's such been a long while. time. But um, yeah, life life kind of got in the way, uh, especially for me. You guys have been done for a while. Um, but it's not just that life got in the way. But maybe we can get to that in in a moment um people will be expecting a recap which we do not have for them so it's not a we thing it's a you thing (sighs) fine right yeah (laughs) maybe we could have come up with one we could have well um i I was hoping that uh ryan do you want to do you want to give us a brief rundown of kind of the broad strokes of what happened in this book we pick up the story uh as soon uh, wakes up going with the crew, they're going to go take over the city that she killed everyone in in the last book. Right, which I can't remember the name of, uh, but that's okay. Renanus. Renanus, yeah, thank Renanus. you. Yeah. Uh, so we follow that group there for a little bit. She resumes her quest-ish for to find her daughter. She keeps wanting to go on that quest, but things keep getting in the way. And uh, eventually, we all end up at a, um, what, a core point? Mm-hmm. Yes, yes. Yeah. We all end up at Core Point, where her daughter Nasun and Shafa have gathered. She goes there uh, again, searching for her, um, and they're basically going to try and set right what was done wrong. And then we have this whole additional narrative that is introduced in this book of the story of Silanagist. Right. Which, okay. Yeah. So now we've got two two narratives. Well, okay, we have the third in Silanagist, like you said. Is it Silanagist? I'm trying to remember if that's exactly right, but. Uh, but that's the prequel story of how the how the Stone Eaters were born, how uh, Origins came to be, how the moon got blasted away from Earth. Right, it's uh, and so story. it's yeah, exactly Hoa's origin story, um, and uh, and also Sil- no Silver's the magic steel steel uh, his steel origin story and what a ruby antimony her- yeah antimony. all of them yeah. where they all came from and so that story kind of sets the sets the scene for when we get to core point and then we've got two uh two stories that get us there we've got essen who's going to uh use the obelisk gate to uh, essentially lasso the moon put it back in orbit and fix what was done wrong with the moon and then nasun is there to use the obelisk gate to turn the world everybody in the world into stone eaters eventually that becomes her goal right. wasn't her initial goal but yes she she's is. what 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 is her initial goal she goes there to what destroy the world it, make the moon collide with right the that's what yeah. i thought yeah that's okay yeah so as she's going there that's why she initially goes mm-hmm. and then once she gets there oh boy some stuff happens yeah she so, wants the best of both worlds and both of her choices that she's given when she has there's a conversation she has with uh steel i believe where um is it steel mm-hmm. i don't remember i think so but it's basically if you do the if you do this shafa will live forever but he'll be alone and, t- and he'll be miserable but if you don't do this then he's going to die and so she tries to find the best of both worlds and the best of both worlds is to change everybody into stone eaters 
and right mm-hmm. she ends up because of the love of her mother not doing that uh oh boy yeah okay so now that we've kind of got the very broad strokes mm-hmm. i will point out that it's it's interesting that we have now we, we spent the most time in that three or four minute uh rundown of the story talking about sil anagist and the very end of the story mm-hmm. but Essen and Nasun's journeys to get to that point didn't just didn't get me. Really? Yeah, not. I, it, this is part of why I was saying it's not just that life got in the way. I had a really hard time uh, motivating myself mm-hmm. to keep reading through this book. I, I felt a similar thing during Obelisk Gate, um, but I think it was it was Obelisk Gate and then the beginning of this book kind of. Um, compounded that sure and i just i lost a lot of my motivation to keep reading but i knew from what people had said nobody spoiled the story i didn't know i had no idea what was coming other than that it was a big brash bold ending um and so i was like okay well i gotta get there yeah Mm -hmm. and it delivered i thought i i thought the ending was i i i do have mixed feelings but um it's mostly positive with a a little bit of um not even negative but just um not uh, unsure yeah feelings about the ending Uh, and i think i'll have to sit with it for a little while before i know exactly how i feel about it but anyway um the ending of this book kind of uh fulfilled on a lot of the promises of the first book where i I loved the first book i thought it was Mm -hmm. crazy good um and then the next to kind of dragged until we got to that ending and i was like okay i am super in let's do this right um, it was about the last i don't know maybe quarter of this book that uh that i felt that way ryan what about you so uh knowing that we were going to be talking about this today i had time to actually go through and do a reread uh, <laughs> that's how slow i was <laughs> <yeah>. <laughs> on it and i i definitely appreciated it and i'm glad i had the chance to go through it a second time I think that there is a lot in this story um, that I missed on the first go around in terms of things that merited me pausing and taking some time to think. Yeah. Uh, I very much uh, enjoy this book. I will say that this is one of those books that I definitely cannot give to everybody. Um, I know, you know, usually we kind of finish up with, can you, who do you recommend this to? Mm. Do you want um, to start with that? Yeah, let's start with that. But it, there are those who I know will not will not catch what the feel of this story is and what the what it is the author's intent is in saying a lot of these things, or it may bother them. And I'm not again. I, have to, I think you should read things like that. And stuff, but I know there's some people who would just they would read some things and go, "I'm done with this. Yeah, I'm not yeah. dealing with this, and I'm putting it away." Mm-hmm. And so. It is one that I have to be a little more selective of who I who I would recommend it to, but not because of its quality, simply because it's more of like a content advisory type thing for people. Oh, okay. So uh, kind of a, like a trigger warning kind of thing yeah, for, for those who would have to deal with uh, like uh, child loss, parental issues, or... Uh, Some of those things, uh, if you have, if you are straight up and honest, if you have issues with discussing racism... Uh, that is a very prominent thing as sure. if she's very definitively said some things in previous books and in this book she has very strong line uh, lines written in here that is i am talking about this i hope you don't miss it right mm-hmm. <laughs> yeah there <laughs> she she will not allow you to miss anything uh through these books um and there there is a question that so for those of us who um are wondering about how we approach that sort of thing as the legendarium we did get a good question about that um that i'm going to save for the wrap-up episode so today we'll talk about the stone sky um and then um sometime in the next week or two we'll do a wrap-up episode where we'll kind of talk about the whole series and i'll have had a little more time to sit with (laughs) this final book and you know maybe have some other or even different thoughts than what i share today yeah Uh, we'll see um, but anyway, so yeah, I think that's going to be a really interesting topic for us mm-hmm. to, to get into. Um, and especially as we try to navigate it uh, a- as us, right, in the right. way that we try to do things. So yeah, it's going to be an interesting discussion. Um, all right, Sarah, where do you want to go with the Stone Sky at this point? What do you want to talk about? What, um, I don't know. What's on your mind? I know you've got some notes I and some thoughts. I do have notes. Um well, I guess I'll say before getting into specific 
things that I have written down. I I envy Ryan's reread. Oh, I feel same. Like yes. This is this feels like the kind of book and series that really needs two times through. Um and that like literally to the point where I was completely confused about certain characters like core motivations. Yeah. I there were times when um Essen would be talking about doing things because that's what Alabaster would want and I was like that's what Alabaster would want. I I had a totally different read on that guy, right. you know? Um and I don't know if that was a matter of getting confused between characters, just not carefully reading enough. I I really don't know, but um but yeah, for me the ending and and what Ryan mentioned about um Nasen not uh going through with her, you know, turn everybody to stone eaters plan. That ending didn't really didn't land for me mm-hmm. because I f- I didn't feel like I had enough time to believe it. Like b- believe in the changes that would have taken place between Essen and Nasen in that moment and her feeling her the love for her mother and like it just we took so much time to get there and I actually didn't mind it. I was very captivated by the journey to get mm-hmm. to core point and what happened in core point, especially between uh, Nasun and Shafa while they were there for that like extra time. Um, we took so much time to get there and then the ending just fell not, not a hundred percent flat, but didn't fully satisfy me as much as I expected it to. Yeah, no, that makes sense. Well, speaking of, um, of uh, this, what, what did you say? Something about speed or, or whatever. Um, and you mentioned that the characters, you, you weren't sure about the characters' motivations. Mm-hmm. And, and, you know, I, I wondered about that, too. How well have these things been communicated uh, to me as a reader? Uh, am I to blame for not paying close enough attention? Do I, like, should I need a reread like Ryan got? Um, you know, I, I, at this point, yes, I do. But should I need one? Mm-hmm. You know, I think this is a legit question. Um and did either of you read the acknowledgments at the end? Um, uh, she wrote a page I'm or two sure of I acknowledgments. Did. I think I remember her talking about her mother. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. Anyway, so I was surprised by that. I, I had no idea about any of that. I intentionally did not seek out anything about her. You know, I just wanted to read her book. Yeah. And, you know, take it as I, as I, as I found it. Uh, but what she said was this book in particular, I think both of the, the second and third books, but this book in particular was written during a really tough time for her where she was going through a ton of life changes and her mother was uh, on her deathbed. Mm-hmm. Um, so in the final months or, or years of her life. And so she was spending a lot of time taking care of her mom. It's really heartbreaking stuff. And it definitely casts some of the, the ending especially, but the whole series in a different light. Um but it did make me wonder she wrote all of these on deadline you know got them in on time Mm -hmm. and fantasy readers be grateful you know Mm -hmm. (laughs) somebody was paying attention to her deadlines right um but it did make me wonder there's uh, would this book ryan have been better served with another six months of revisions or you know like in your mind, and, and of course you've reread it, so I don't know, you know, maybe mm-hmm. maybe this is an unfair question, but um, was everything, do you think, spelled out the way it could have or should have been? Or do you think maybe this volume was rushed, especially compared to the first one? I don't think that it was rushed, necessarily. Mm-hmm. I don't know that it needed more time. Uh, I don't view this piece as the like a beautifully polished gemstone because that's not the feeling that it's trying to elicit Mm -hmm. it's a lot more raw it's a lot more uh, direct and rough yeah uh just like its characters like its world everything about it uh so to try and polish it more give it a little more time try and do that i don't think would be true to what this piece is Mm. i i feel this very much uh fits in there not to say that it's like that there are major flaws or something i there's nothing in this story that i went yeah, I can't. I can't deal with that. I can't deal with that at all. Yeah. Um, so that to me, I think it's it fits within its uh, within the realm of what it was created. Yeah. Okay. Mm-hmm. Sarah, what about you? 
Yeah, I, I don't think I would say, given what I know, which is the book, I, I also don't know much about Jemison outside of these works. Based on what I know, I wouldn't say, oh, this needed more time. Because this may be exactly what she wanted it to be and right. like the fullest realization of what she was aiming to create. And I absolutely agree that tone of like rough and sometimes rushed and sometimes like not quite knowing which way is up or, or what's important and dealing with trauma and survival. It makes sense that there would be some things that are not spelled out completely. And I am confident that if I went back and reread, I would pick up on those things and have like, there would be some dots connected that my brain just skipped over this time around. Yeah. So no, I, I don't think I would go nearly so far as to say like this needed more time. I, I think it was probably exactly what it was supposed to be for mm -hmm. her. Okay. Yeah. Now I, I did not ask this question because I was like, Oh man, this is a rough hewn gem yeah. that, you know, whatever. Um, I, I'm open to that, certainly, uh, but I guess part of the reason I wonder about that is because I had such a hard time with the motivations and, you know, wait, wait, so what is the relationship between the, like, mm -hmm. it, like you said with Alabaster, what is, what is she talking about? I didn't see any of that or whatever. Uh, on the other hand, <laughs> I guess, going back to, to book two, um, we we kind of got into a discussion about whether Shafa was really changed, mm. and I feel like I feel like I nailed that one. Like I, <laughs> I got what she was throwing down for Shafa, you know. So <laughs> I guess maybe it's a little uneven on my part. But anyway, this this all reminds me of, um, and I know I've told this story a couple times on the podcast, so I apologize for repetition for longtime listeners. But uh, my first uh, experience with the Silmarillion, where it, it, it the thing is like 300 pages it's not a long book you know as far as word count but it took me three months to get through i think i was 17 at the time maybe it took me three months to read it i got to the very end and i went i have no idea what the heck just happened and i went immediately yeah. back to page one reread it and went oh my word that is wonderful mm -hmm. and so i wonder if it, you, there's there's a a little part of my brain that wants to blame an author it, to some extent mm -hmm. when I don't get things yeah, right, right away. Right. It's like, come on, you got to explain this to me at least a little better. Um, but no, I, I think it's totally fair to, to say like, maybe I just wasn't picking up certain things. Yeah. I wasn't paying attention. I don't have the life experience necessary for to pick up what she's thrown down. You know, whatever the yeah. case may be. Right? And I wonder if similar to the Silmarillion based on my experience reading that book having ha time. having read the silmarillion ladies and gentlemen <laughs> one time as a gift to craig <laughs> <laughs> literally uh, but i i wonder how much of it is not even like a matter of blaming the author versus blaming yourself you know blaming makes it sound like more serious yeah, than yeah. it is but i i wonder if like the silmarillion it's just a matter of like i'm not used to reading this language having this sort of tone in my head and i need time to adjust to it once my brain is sort of calibrated, then I can go back to the beginning and like have my feet under me a little bit. And then I can pick up on things a little, a little more um, consistently. Yeah. Maybe it's the same thing with the stone sky. This is, I mean, you two know better than I do that this is not typical uh, fair in the fantasy sci-fi genre. Right. And so after having read it, maybe it's, it's almost like an inoculation in your brain. Like you, you've <laughs> like your brain understands what that particular thing is supposed to be. And then when you read it again, you're prepared for it. Are you, are you saying we need mental antibodies for Jemison? Cause that's offensive. I don't think that that's what I'm saying. <laughs> no, I, I think I know what you're saying. Ryan, look, you look like you have thoughts. I do. I've been mulling over something that's on my mind uh, with this. I I feel like this book series, but this book in particular, is not one that you can passively consume. Mm. Uh, mm, if yeah. you do not, if there isn't a connection to a character or a theme or a concept or something there for you uh, that you feel as you go through it, and you will feel it. It's not something that you will piece together, um, but you will feel it. If it's not there, I completely understand why this book would be a difficult one to get through. Yeah. Um, because I really, in in a lot of stories, you can, at, at the base level, you can at least go back to plot and say, I can follow from point A to point B to point C. Right. And the plot is enough to at least get you through. Uh, this one, 
it's not that it's a bad plot or anything. It's just it is a felt plot. It is very mm -hmm. much about the character's response. And it's coming from now that you know the whole truth, a potentially mildly unreliable narrator. Mm -hmm. uh, Hoa is relating her own life back to her. Right. Uh, which is why we're getting that perspective. And he's there for all of it, and we can trust his view. But anytime we're talking about what uh, uh, Nasun is thinking, or uh, as soon as thinking or feeling, it's Hoa, his interpretation, it's his interpretation of, of that yeah. moment. Yeah. And he's already admitted that that wasn't a strong point of the Stone Eaters at the beginning. Like, mm -hmm. to be able to read and do those, like, they can't replicate it themselves. Yeah. Um, and so also that he romanticizes her so yes. much, you know. Yeah. Anyway, proceed. Which, no, that, which is basically the end of the book. Like, the this whole thing has been built to her being turned into a Stone Eater and then riding off into the sunset, basically. Mm -hmm. She and, and Hoa, which I I didn't see coming. Yeah, I, me neither. That took me by surprise, frankly. Yeah. Very interesting reproductive cycle <laughs> yeah turn someone into stone consume them and then let them be reborn in a stone eaters yeah that and was then they're weird. your girlfriend <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> that's so, one way to, that's one way to get a girlfriend i guess but there is there is a portion of that um hoa says something in this book specifically about his relationship with her that i have come to really really appreciate and really love um says uh when it comes to love, oh shoot, I wish I had the quote pulled up for me. But basically he says, I think when it comes to love, when you, or I think when you love someone, you don't get to decide how they love you back. Oh yeah, yes, yeah. That, I had that written down That was too. mentally highlighted for sure. That yeah. was on my part. Such a, it's a beautiful line. And knowing Hoa's long, like what this whole story is turning out to be and everything, that ultimately she could have rejected him at the end as well. And he still would have loved her. Like, I don't know if Hoa is what the kids would call a simp these days. <laughs> <laughs> this is a newly introduced word to my vocabulary, by the way, and it has been coming up constantly. So, and and who would have thought Ryan would be the next source? <laughs> yes, I'm. Our, I'm our outreach to the youth these days. <laughs> <laughs> Clearly, just look at you. Yes. <laughs> uh, <laughs> so I, I think this actually um, uh, this this gets us into another thing that I wanted to talk about, uh, and I know you guys have notes, so please don't let me uh, monopolize this. Um, but can we talk about the prose style? Now that we've had three books of it, we talked about it a little bit in the first book. I don't remember talking much about it in book two. I don't think we did. Um, but now that we've uh, had three books under our belt, um, I... Okay, how do I put this? Like you said, Sarah, she is not normal fare for fantasy readers mm -hmm. as far as her prose style. Mm -hmm. Um... I I would put her there's like a I'm thinking of a continuum sure. and on one end you've got let's say the the Brandon Sandersons of the world you know maybe Robert Jordan where the the language is utterly straightforward they are they are um, uh, <laughs> I hesitate to even use the words painting a picture with their words because that that um, calls to mind you know more artistry and poetry and that's that's just not his style his he he calls it the clear glass style. Mm. Right, my words are a window for you to look out on whatever scene, and I don't want anything to get in the way. On the other end of it, I'm I'm going way past so many other authors that we've read, and going to authors that we haven't read. Somebody like uh, Cormac McCarthy or uh, Chuck Palahniuk, uh, where it's just bizarre structural um, choices that are being made. It, it can be difficult to follow. But like you said, Ryan, it's more felt than thought mm -hmm. um, with with that prose style. Um, and so you, anyway, so you've got this continuum with these two styles, uh, prose styles on either end. And you go from Sanderson, and people talk about um, Rothfuss being more artistic. Uh, and I would put her further on the other side further than from Rothfuss. Rothfuss. Yeah, as far as um, the the kind of. Oh, rule breaking kind of free form poetry version of prose i don't know quite how to describe it but i i found her prose style more poetic than rothfuss's and i'm not saying that um as a compliment or uh derogatorily like that it's i just feel like that's where she's at i don't know what what do you guys what do you think 
I struggle. I, I struggle to know how to gauge pros. Mm, yeah, uh, yeah. There's a there's a YouTube video for you to do. How do I ra- how do I rate pros? <laughs> sure. Um, so for me to s- when you say that she's on the other side of Rothfuss, that's just my gut feeling is no. From my experiences of reading Rothfuss and her and her style, I definitely it was weird, especially going into first person narrative. Uh, it threw me for a bigger loop at the beginning, but I feel like of the two of them, I can. Hers was a little bit more on the clear clear glass side, I guess. Interesting. Okay. Uh, but that's my limited understanding. That's just my my emotional, you know, right, response. Right. Your gut reaction. Yeah. yeah, absolutely. Something to think yeah. about maybe uh, before the next episode. Yeah. Um, I don't know. What about you, Sarah? I, I know you don't have the same kind yeah, of uh, like, fantasy I'm experience. Like, what's but, Rothfuss? But what is, you, who's, where's that? Name of the Wind. You've read that one, or at least part of it. I th- yeah, with I think both right. and uh, the like, universe. Like Never, don't worry about it. <laughs> okay. How did you like her prose style? Well, it's interesting. I I think I'm kind of on the same page as Ryan a little bit. Like, how do you rate these things? Because you saying that Sanderson is more straightforward than Jemison, I'm like, no. <laughs> I'm reading Jemison, and yeah. it, it's speaking. It's like it is not a struggle for me to understand Jemison. And it was a struggle for me to understand Sanderson. It's very straightforward to me. So yeah. I, I don't know how much of this is just subjective. Um, oh, I think very. Yeah. I mean, right. It, it has to be. Um, and I would say, you know, as we've established previously, this is not the sort of stuff that I gen- generally read. Um, I'm not a fantasy reader by and large. And Jemison is... L- you know, I prefer a really poetic po- prose style. Right. And Jemison is less poetic in her prose than most writers that I read. Right. So, no, that makes a lot of sense. Like yeah. you said, this is totally subjective. Yeah. And I think maybe it's just a matter of... Um, I, I think there is there is probably an objective way to measure uh, they, right. a, a prose style and, you know, how, what kind of sentence structures they use yeah. and that sort of thing. Like, that's fine. But ultimately, it kind of comes down to whether something is more or less comprehensible to you is going to have more to do with matching styles. Yeah. Right. And mm-hmm. so you live your life more poetically than I do. Boy, do I. <laughs> <laughs> and, I and I live my life more prosaically than you do. Okay. Um, and so I, I intuitively, instinctively sure. get a Sanderson yeah. sentence quicker than I yeah, do. Yeah, it's a kind Jemison of what we were one. talking about before about the idea of kind of calibrating your brain to be to match with whatever uh, writing style an author has. Your brain is very calibrated for Tolkien. Your brain is very calibrated for Sanderson. Um, and, you know, I'm mostly reading nonfiction. I'm mostly reading memoir. And my brain is more calibrated for something like Jemison. Yeah, yeah. This, that brings up a very interesting thing I've been thinking about a lot lately um, and we don't have to spend a lot of time on it but I've taken a lot of liking to discussing things not so much in good bad uh, objective yeah. objectively good and bad things but more so uh, how it resonates and yeah. I use a lot of the resonance as a setup because the idea of having to calibrate your mind or figuring out what it is that is best in harmony with the way that you think and feel uh, or is best able to your style of communication and, and uh consuming material that i think speaks a lot to you as a person when you're reading a book to understand you as a person uh, understanding that so i just i think that concept we just uh, we talked about really plays into this theme um if if something is resonating with you or not doesn't necessarily objectively mean that it's a good or bad thing on the other end it's your relationship with the content Mm -hmm. yeah 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 um i i'm i've been kind of just glancing around for an example um and i know there's a bit where Hoa, this is in the coda. So Hoa mm-hmm. is waiting for um, Essen to wake up uh, as a stone eater. So I wait. Time passes. A year, a decade, a week. And those, and like those are three sentences. Mm-hmm. That's mm-hmm. So that's, you know, very, very McCarthy-esque, you know, mm-hmm. uh, in its... Uh, its uh, lack of verbiage i guess mm. literally <laughs> except the word <laughs> passes. You know, passes yeah <laughs> anyway um so yeah it's just it's just a different style and mm-hmm. like you said sarah uh, 
I, I think that's a, a smart point. My brain is calibrated in a different way. Yeah. And so, to Ryan's point, the reread helps a lot. And I and that was my first thought as I f- was finishing this book was, I got to reread this. Yeah. Not yet. <laughs> Not yet. Uh-huh. Uh, but yeah, I, I will be rereading this at some point. Um, and now that I kind of have more of a handle, it's, <clears throat> in fact, it's a lot like the Silmarillion in that way where, I I didn't know what had happened, but I kind of had an inkling of who the characters were, some of the relationships, and, yeah. and now I can now I can focus a little bit more on the themes and the plot now that I've mm-hmm. got the characters, you know, or yeah. whatever. So, all right, what else do we want to talk about, Ryan? Have, you look like you got something. I do have I have a question for you because I, I hinted at it in our very first episode when we did the first book. No, oh, great. Uh, but didn't didn't want to say anything. Um, the Earth is an actual character. Yeah. Right. What are your thoughts on this? Uh, to actually have Father Earth be a character who speaks and hates the people that live on him. Yeah. Uh, I have thoughts. Sarah, do you have thoughts? Just that I was, I really liked a lot of, I just bumped the microphone. Oh, <laughs> Hopefully no. Hopefully everything's okay. Um, I, I had a lot of feelings. It really resonated for me. <laughs> um, Very nice. Those passages of kind of hammering home the fact that, no, the earth is a living being. And if and ignoring that, it like you, you are ignoring that. It's not just that you don't know, but there's evidence that you are looking away from as far as like you Is it okay if I read something? Yeah, Would yeah. That be absolutely. All right? Because I just thought it was I guess so it depends well done. on what you want to read. It's not from the book. It's from Elle magazine. <laughs> um, <laughs> I thought it was just so perfect. It's a BuzzFeed quiz I found. That it just, <laughs> let me know exactly which Jamison character I was. Uh, let's see. Um, magic comes from life. Those who made the obelisks sought to harness magic, and they succeeded. Oh, how they succeeded. They used it to build wonders beyond imagining. But then they wanted more magic than just what their own lives or the accumulated eons of life and death on the Earth's surface could provide. And when they saw how much magic grinned just beneath that surface, ripe for the taking, it may never have occurred to them that so much magic, so much life, might be an indicator of awareness. The Earth does not speak in words, after all, and perhaps these builders of the great obelisk network were not used to respecting lives different from their own. Not so very different, really, from the people who run the fulcrums or raiders or her father. So where they should have seen a living being, they saw only another thing to exploit. Where they should have asked or left alone, they raped. For some crimes, there is no fitting justice, only reparation. That last sentence didn't quite land as well for me because I was like, well, what? I'm not sure I understand the difference between justice and reparation. But anyway, but just that idea that like, you're okay, now now taking- we need to set up Sarah at the legendarympodcast.com. You're going to get all sorts of emails. <laughs> <laughs> no, okay, sorry. What were but we anyway, the, just the idea that, like, how could you think that you could take life from the earth and not realize that the earth is alive? You know, it just, it was really moving to me. And also as somebody who is uh, at least loosely involved in, like, very new agey, earth-based uh, religion communities, I just was thinking constantly of all the crystals that like people collect. I'm like, <laughs> it's from the earth. Like it's a living thing. <laughs> anyway. Yeah. That, it, that was a really powerful theme to me of, of just like you, you can't, you can't act like there isn't plentiful evidence that the earth is alive and now it's talking back to you. Yeah. Uh, so for my part, uh, yes to all that. I would just add that for me, it was too little too late in mm-hmm. the story mm-hmm. uh, and so I, I thought it was a very interesting avenue to go down and we went down it you know 75 percent into the third book in the trilogy right where you know that things were hinted at uh, you know the the evil earth and the the, the lost child and all that stuff yeah, like the they're stories. little little hints at it um and then they go through uh, the, the way we find out uh, for sure is they're going through the mantle hoa's pulling them or no sorry it's when nasun is going um through the core with uh shafa Shafa, Shafa. thank you in that in that like living yeah the uh, vehicle yeah vehicle (laughs) right the vehicle animal right exactly (laughs) the vehicle and so they're going through the core and the closer she gets to the core of the earth the more she becomes aware of 
the sentience uh, yes. of the earth. And so that, that's how we find out about it. And I'm sitting there going, dope. This is awesome. You're way too late with this. <laughs> but can I push back against that I, a little bit? I just, I guess, I let me just say, yeah. I, I thought it was really cool. I wish it were explored a lot more. Yeah. Um, and so he's, it, the earth is a character, maybe uh, like in the same way that, that, uh, that Sauron is a character in the Lord of the Rings, like where you, he's just kind of this presence off in the distance. Mm. But in this case, you get real close and you get, you get a quick little conversation with him and then you're gone. Yeah. And I'm like, no, no, I needed, I needed a lot more than that for father earth. So. Yeah. No, that makes sense. And I can't disagree. I would have, I would have liked to see that explored more and which might have necessitated exploring it earlier. But I, I felt kind of implicated in that very um, thought, because the whole time they're talking, uh, they're talking about Father Earth as a living sentient being, just through their um, the stone lore. You know, they're talking right. about Father Earth, and Father Earth is angry and and lost his child, and and this whole time I'm like, well, yeah, because that's their creation story. Got it. You know, but I'm just like dismissing it completely. Um, but the evidence is there, so like. I, the, the evidence is there. They didn't explore it um, as a reality super early on, but kind of not... You, you, you as the reader are also one who doesn't understand the evidence until it is, like, glaringly obvious. And right. I kind of liked that aspect. Yeah. Okay. Ryan, did we sufficiently answer your question? I think so. Okay. <laughs> I, I do think that... Jemison's turn on making the Earth an actual living character is a stroke of genius in the way that she executes on this. I know you feel it's a little late, uh, but she plays on the expectations on the expectation of the reader to do what we do with the idea of Mother Earth, Father Earth, those things. Mm -hmm. They're concepts. They're not characters. They're yeah. just a thing that floats out there. And so she says, play with that for two books. And then I'm going to reveal to you that, no, they're actually a character. Right. And when you go back and look at these things, and when you do your reread and go through, you're going to realize every time I'm talking about this that it is a character here and what that means. That, yeah, Father Earth is pissed that the moon is gone. Legitimately and literally, he is angry because the moon is gone. Most of us are probably like, oh, yeah, that messes with the tides and everything. So that, yeah, Father Earth is angry, but no. <laughs> like the same way that we do with, you know... So stories of like myths from whatever long lost culture mm -hmm. just like oh yeah they came up with a story to explain why the volcano erupted or why there were seasons like because Demeter is wandering the earth and she misses <laughs> Persephone so much um, which also like definitely saw a reference to that in in the stone sky but anyways like well now people are going to want to know well I'll share in a minute but yeah just we, we go oh yeah these simple people with their simple stories to explain the world whatever like, it no. it kind of it touches on a theme that I felt really coming up in this book in particular in the trilogy because we got such a look at Silanagist and the the science that or the the scientific ways that people were harnessing magic. Um, so which brings up somebody's question. I can't remember if we'll get to it today or, or next time, but it was: Is this book sci-fi or fantasy, mm -hmm. or is this trilogy sci-fi or fantasy? Yeah. Um, anyway, but. Um, Oh, where was I even going? Uh, oh, yeah. The th one of the themes that cropped up in this book because of that versus the Father Earth is real and these uh, kind of, you know, these what we look at as rustic tribal people who, yeah. you know, because of the seasons, they can't progress. They can't uh, advance the way that uh, civilization had before, whatever. But anyway, it kind of felt like one of the themes was civilization and science are a net negative mm. and take us away from our uh, from nature from our nature mm -hmm. from uh the the insights that we used to have it's very um um rousseauian you know the the kind of noble savage mm -hmm. type of uh thinking anyway do you guys did you get any of that did you do, am i on solid ground or am i completely nuts i think you're not wrong, but not entirely right either in that sense. I think that the message isn't that science and civilization take us away from our nature here. It's that 
science and civilization built in the way that it is the way that it was built in this story is a negative um, to do what you have done through science through exploitation through these things that is what the problem is it's not that the not that we are able to exist as a society right those things it's that you've done it through the exploitation of an entire race that you've subjugated into these nodes right and things like that yeah so I think that's more of what the conversation is versus no we should always just live with the land and <laughs> and that sort of thing right yeah I don't know Sarah any thoughts um the way I, I think I think Ryan had a, a really good answer basically I think your uh your suspicion there about science and civilization and what the book is saying I think there's evidence for that but it's not the message that I came away with mm. um and there was just a ver- a really brief quote from the book that kind of felt related um it is the way of the world but it it but it isn't the things that happen to origins don't just happen they've been made to happen by the guardians after years and years of work on their part and i feel like there's a lot of references um in this book and probably throughout the series if i went back and looked for them of saying just because it is this way doesn't mean it had to be this way it was not destined it, it is not like guaranteed that this is how science has to evolve or this is how civilizations have to be built there were choices made and there were choices reinforced and so i don't come away from the book feeling like anything other than like oppression is uh you know villainized it's like you can do lots of different things but they they can they can come about in ways that are fair and thoughtful and uh just or not um so yeah the science and civilization thing i didn't come away with an anti-science viewpoint myself uh, yeah it's i don't know if i would even go so far as to call yeah no maybe anti-science i don't know yeah. i'm not sure i again i haven't I'd thought have to, about it it didn't I need stand to, out to me so i need I to read know. it again i need to think about it more yeah. i just finished the book you know sure. so anyway. i do think that along these lines though she states a thesis early on in the book it's a line that really stood out to me, and I know it stood out to a lot of people because I've seen it quoted in a whole bunch of different things. Mm-hmm. <laughs> um, but right towards the very beginning, she says, some worlds are built on a fault line of yeah. pain, Ooh. held up by nightmares. Don't lament when those worlds fall. Rage that they were built doomed in the first place. I think that's more so what she's aiming to talk about is that these concepts of if it's built in a bad way, built to fail from the very beginning, that's the problem Mm -hmm. yeah 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 Yeah. okay so let's i i know we need to get to some uh discord comments i don't know we're using a new system so i don't know how long we've actually been recording i think it's about 45 minutes or so so uh we've got how long this episode ends up being is how long it ends up being (laughs) yeah (laughs) exactly um so we've got some stuff to get through do you guys want to dip into your notes or should i go to i think just discord i think just do the discord let's just see where it goes from there what do you think that's fine. Okay. There's a couple character things I think we could discuss. Um, well, let's Shafa and Nasu and things like that, but they'll probably, I'm guessing some of them might come up in the Discord. Well, we'll, we'll see. We'll see. Um, okay, so uh, Jafu asked, Sil Anagist was weird. <laughs> I'm, I'm quoting here. Uh, bold move to throw us into a totally new world uh, in the third book, especially one so strange. Uh, like it or have a hard time with it? No. Think about that because the uh, uh, Tor... Toromir um, asked a companion question. How did you feel about hearing about things we already know about from a completely different angle using new terminology and having to piece together information based on clues? Is it good storytelling or unnecessarily convoluted? Also, did the Sil Anagist chapters have tension for you or did it just feel inevitable? After all, you knew where it would end all along. So me and Jafu are sort of asking the same thing. I just have other words. So, <laughs> so yeah, how did we feel about um, maybe the way this book was structured and the way some of the information was brought to us with these flashbacks to Sil Anagist? How did you guys like it? Um, I had a hard time with Sil Anagist. I was definitely intrigued by a lot of it, um, but it, it did throw me for a loop a little bit, and I hate to be, like, I feel like people are going to roll their eyes at this part, but... So you had the Stone Eaters before they became the Stone Eaters, where they called Tuners, I yes. think. 
That sounds right. All their names ended in the same syllable, and I could not keep their names straight <laughs> at all. Gehwa and Hoa. I right. I knew I knew Hoa, but like everybody else, I didn't even try that much. It actually reminded me when I was working at a catering company in high school, and a set of triplets started working there, and they were identical <laughs> triplets, and all their names started with a K, and I. I'm not going to lie. I worked with them for a year and a half and I never even tried to figure out who was who. <sighs> Terrible. <sighs> so anyway, traumatic stress flashback to my <laughs> own <laughs> failing as a teenage colleague. But like there were hard things for me about Sil Anagist. I wanted to sink my teeth into it more. I felt like there was so much there, but there were some real obstacles. For yeah. Me. Ryan? Sil Anagist is a much, much better experience on a reread. I will just tell you that right now. Oh, I yeah. have no doubt. Because I, I wanted to spend more of the book in Silana just on this last read through uh, to get because I no longer needed the clarity of what am I reading. Like I kind of get where I'm, what this mm-hmm. is going. I'm kind of piecing together what's happening. I didn't have to figure that. Out. I knew where it was going, what was happening, so I could I could get a little more into the grit and details on the second time through. Yeah. Um, the first time though, I had a very similar experience where it was. I'm trying to connect dots. I'm spending the time trying to connect the dots of mm-hmm. what I'm reading to what I know. Yeah. Um, I wasn't surprised. I wasn't overly surprised by it because I actually kind of figured at some point in time we have to address how the world got like this. Mm-hmm. So we're going to get it, and we're going to have that Planet of the Apes moment at the Statue <laughs> of Liberty. <laughs> My <laughs> God. <laughs> yeah. yeah, we're going to have that moment. I wasn't sure how big it was going to be. So to have it be an entire series of chapters actually to me i felt like paid the dues necessary to make it work versus just having like as soon show up at core point watch a hologram that popped up and of the uh, one of the scientists being like oh no the machine's gone bad oh no (laughs) (laughs) it's changing my body and now i'm hoa (laughs) you know the funny thing about that is you said that like uh the mr scientist guy from the simpsons oh and oh, I, yeah. I was also thinking of The Simpsons with the, the Planet of the Apes reference. <laughs> it was Earth all along. <laughs> okay. So anyway. Um, <laughs> I, Did I throw you off enough or do you want to keep yes, going? Yes, just a little bit. Okay. No, Silana just... Um, there's a really fun experiment to do when reading through Silana just uh, to play the game of what's changed and what hasn't um, in terms of the society expectations and what you've been reading through up to this point. Right, right. How far has society slipped? Where were they at mm-hmm. at this point to then take us back to where we are at the start of Broken Earth? Yeah. Like, it's, it really is quite interesting to see how far humanity went before they fell apart and how the Stone Eaters came to be and what it means to be a Stone Eater and uh, to be a tuner, I guess. Mm. Now, when they finally make the connection of those who can, uh, who can control who, those who are who are origins and can control magic are tuners, which means that there are those who are not. Right. Both. Right. So. So where where I had a thought about this. Um, the whole the sill anagist thing. Oh yeah, you were talking about. It was interesting to see the the similarities and differences in the in the two societies we're looking at. Um, I think part of what she's getting at with. Uh, drawing both of those societies for us to look at is like look at how this okay so there was i can't remember the name of the race that the nias nias yeah um that were that were hated by this people and they were annihilated or very nearly so and then when they created their uh kind of automatons their ais basically is what i gathered that they they are um, they made them in the image of this people that they hated, right? So that they could oppress them all over again. And and it, am I am I right so I far? I think that's not, that? that's a little different than how I understood it. It was more like the Neus had been uh, the the ruling class, whoever had attributed certain qualities and dangers to them that they didn't really have any more than anybody else. And so in order to keep up that ruse, when they created the beings that actually did have those powers, they had to make them look like like the Nias. Yeah, okay. Anyway, Anyway. I mean, it it is a little like, I'm not even sure that that's right. Please proceed. (laughs) So regardless, uh, my point is that um, because they set up this uh, very systemic, oppressive system, 
a, a systemic system, if you will. Sure, yes. Uh, yeah, I'm very smart, ladies and gentlemen. <laughs> Welcome to the <laughs> Department of Redundancy Department. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> uh, so because they'd set up this system, uh, it carried through the the shattering and all these seasons, and that was the basis on which this uh, the society that Nasen and Essen live in it, you know, it, it forms the basis of their society. This uh, this stratification of the culture and and who the the uh, origins are and what they represent to the the stills and the ruling ruling class and and all that stuff. Um, and it makes it a very man. We're getting back into how pessimistic is she? You know, because uh, what what's the idea at the end of the book? It, it, so Nasun saves the world, puts the moon back in orbit, kind of, you know, it'll take a while, but things yeah. will get back to normal. Yeah. Um, and, and then what? Like the implication in my mind is there is no escape from this. Yeah. There is no, like, and maybe this is something that she and I would agree on. I, I'm not sure. Uh, somebody asked me about a question that I would ask N.K. Jemison if I ever had a chance to talk to her. Is, uh, you know, what are your thoughts about human nature and mm. its immutability mm. because i i very much believe there's no there is no reset button on human nature you can nuke it and leave us with an adam and eve and they'll you know repopulate the earth and people will be people you know and they will build the same kind of systems and whatnot it's it's in in my mind it's the gradual incremental changes that have gotten us as humanity to where we are today it's not by trying to find some magic utopian reset button gotcha. right and okay. so i wonder i wonder if she and i would agree on that point yeah i don't know yeah um that makes me think of something i and i hope i can i can explain the connection that i'm seeing basically it happened in in the obelisk gate and it happened here again in the stone sky where basically you learn that even our good guys, so-called Alabaster, Essen, whatever, they are using node maintainers to do their work. Right. And in the first book, the, basically the node maintainer scene is where, I guess at the time, what's her name? Cyanite has her moment of like, wow, this world is broken. You know, not to, no pun intended there. Like this earth is broken. Uh -huh. Um, and this cannot stand and I, I, I can't rest and just like decide that this is okay. That's, that's because of the scene with the node maintainer. And yet that horror is not something that they can get away from. That's Alabaster uses node maintainers to create the obelisk gate in the first place, I think. Or if he, I'm using he mimics one, I think, uh, he, I think he uses many node maintainers. He takes a three by three matrix of, of, of node, of. Of node maintainers. node maintainers to create a something similar to what the onyx is a control right to yeah. access the obelisk gate okay and right. then in um here in the stone sky when everybody who was in the geode city kastrima gets to renanus and they're like trying to set up their you know trying to figure out how to live there um there's a part here where it says and it's talking about essen the truth you've understood since you woke up with a stone arm because, by the way, the whole time Essen is turning into, sh her body's turning to stone just like alabasters. I don't know if we've mentioned that. The truth you've understood since you woke up with a stone arm. To survive in Renanus, Kastrima will need the node maintainers. It will need to take care of them. And when those node maintainers die, Kastrima will need to find mm -hmm. some way to replace them. No one's talking about that last part yet. First things first. And it makes me think about the, this idea that, you're ta that you mentioned, Craig, human nature... This is the way that civilization developed in this place, whatever. And even as they're trying to change it, they're they're replicating it. They're reinforcing it. Is that a human nature thing? It reminds me of um, this really well-known saying from Audre Lorde. She said, the master's tools will never dismantle the master's house. The idea being, if you want to change the world, you can't use the same tools that you've used before. that, Or you can't use the same tools that were used to create the world right. as it is. Right. But they don't have, at least as far as, as far as we are told in the story, they don't have another tool. They don't have any other tools than the master's tools, so-called. They don't have tools other than the node maintainers. Right. And so 
does that mean that as you said like this world is just gonna continue to be bad you know maybe not as unstable the fifth seasons will go away but is it just gonna be the same story on a different day right yeah it's yeah, boy this is probably a topic we can get into more on the next episode i i feel like we'll there's yeah. a lot there's a lot there yeah um but i do have one more from chesky uh who asks how did you feel about the development of shafa ryan i know you wanted no. to, to bring up shafa and nasan and uh so I'm, I'm throwing this one straight to you so i have oh other than the fact that uh i called it i called it i called it he was a good guy well you know ish <laughs> whatever <laughs> yeah, I was gonna say big, big ish on that. Um, the the relationship between Shafa and insert character name here uh, is troubling. Nasid. Uh, oh, all Any of, of them. them. Yeah. Oh, okay. Yeah, I yeah no, I I am totally with you on that. I'm I'm being flippant. Just that Shafa was not the same Shafa from book one. Yes. In books two and three. Yes. Yeah. So he wasn't the same, but I think he was just he was a different bad guy. Proceed, right? Well, yeah, it's it makes a difference when the the silver that is connecting him, his connection to the earth, is messed with. Yeah, because we get to see him broken away from the being the bot on the end of a string um, for a while until the end when he actually becomes like super bot on a string. <laughs> <laughs> right. Which oh man, I'm sorry, but real quick, was that a scene that didn't deliver enough? In my mind, it was. I agree. She, uh, she's been nursing comatose Shafa. Then she goes to, you know, destroy the earth. And then Shafa shows up off of his deathbed and has a crazy look in his eyes. And it and says, hello, little enemy. Mm-hmm. Just like the earth. You know, so it's clearly Father Earth has taken control. Yeah. Um, and I was like, awesome. This is so interesting and like what and then nothing yeah i was nothing so i that 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 was so much in this book i was um you know either loved wholeheartedly or maybe it was a little bit iffy on and that one moment i was just like nope screw that that was that big misstep for me trying to remember exactly how that played out because didn't shafa uh shafa it doesn't he fight i can't remember if he fights off earth's influence for a few for a moment or something like that i can't remember exactly if he does, I don't remember that, or it's not stated. I think that's maybe that's part of the point you're talking about is <laughs> that we don't have a very clear idea as to what happened. Maybe people are very upset, going, "How do you not know?" It yeah, was, exactly. You yeah. To- did you did you <laughs> lose some pages in your book? Yeah, I'm not sure what happened either there, but I remember feeling like I thought we were going to get something there. Maybe a confrontation, and a conversation, a oh, something. Yeah. I don't know. I don't know. Anyway, go. Well, I I know I've totally derailed you. I apologize. Yeah, sorry, I do Ryan. this every no, so you're often, fine. but. Sorry. No, but it's uh, the I, the biggest thing with the whole exploring Shafa, you can read this book through so many different lenses on every different reading. And that's why I think this book series is going to last. And, you know, and we can talk more about this when we do full series recap. But abusive relationships mm. in their different styles is the Shafa narrative. And even when he's a good guy, he's still... It's it's built well, on a very bad relationship. I, I'm I'm curious about this um, because I didn't pick up on what you guys seem to have picked up on. Like you were talking, I think Sarah in the last book about how you were just on edge. Yeah. Not the edge of your seat. You were on edge about his relationship with Nasun and how he it, he seemed predatory, yeah. like he had uh, sexual attraction um you know whatever and yeah. by the end of this book i was like no I'm, i i feel confident in saying i never got any of that um it did it felt paternal to yeah. me the whole the whole way through um so what what did i miss about his relationship with nasun because i i felt very much like he was uh the the way that it's, it's explained i think um hoa is explaining it to uh, essen later where shafa the only the only way that he could maintain his sanity and uh it, throughout the what 40,000 years that he's been alive or whatever 30,000 years he's been alive is to love the the people that he's in charge of right, right. so to love his charges um and the sense that i got 
throughout the second and third book was that he was kind of freed from the negative influence of well you know the whatever the the stones in his head the, the core stones mm -hmm. um and was free to just mm -hmm. love nasun without being um also her uh, abuser the way that he was with essen and so many others mm -hmm. right so I, I didn't get the abusive part between him and Nasun, but I'm I'm totally open to the idea that I just missed something. So, yeah. Yeah. Anybody want to take that one on? <laughs> um, I feel like it. Uh, I didn't feel like he was freed from the uh, the negative aspects mm -hmm. of being. I I felt like it was always like. Just it, it was an in, an instinct in him that was just clawing to get out, and Nasun was constantly trying to protect herself from the way that he would hurt her. Um, and the other thing that I wanted to say, I meant to say it last time around in our last episode, but I just forgot or whatever or ran out of time. Mm. To me, the similarities between Shafa and Humbert Humbert in oh, Lolita sure. are immense. There's one quote which to be to be fair I've never read it yeah. so I wouldn't pick up on no, that. No, absolutely. And and I and I I don't know that that's all I can say is that like that's what I brought to the table. I brought that that novel in the back of my head. Mm -hmm. There's one part where he says, "You're my redemption, not soon." Wait. I'm wondering now. Like I I might not have made <laughs> my notes quite, but I think this was Shafa. <laughs> You're my redemption, Nasun. You are all the children I should have loved and protected, even for myself. And if it will bring you peace, then I shall be your guardian till the world burns, my little one. And it's the and you you could say you could read that and be like that is paternal, and that is sincere and loving, and there's no ambiguity in that. But for me, I'm like no, that is <laughs> that is like what a uh, predatory. Um, kidnapping Humbert Humbert says <laughs> about 12 year old Lolita yeah thinking like you are everything to me I you have bewitched me like you I my whole life is you and I have absorbed you into my the core of my like it's yeah it just it all I can say it might reflect more on my suspicion of people like that than anything else but I I felt it constantly yeah it's yeah I I did not pick up on any um like romantic undertones to mm -hmm. like i remember that line quite clearly and um and i didn't think uh, of anything like that so yeah it could just be a difference in yeah. how you and i approach things and i guess i i also what what else is important from the context is just how very vulnerable nasin is and, and how much she places her entire trust and all of her love in him right. and feeling like there is there is such like an overwhelming almost inevitability that he is going to take advantage of that at some point like that was just constantly yeah that interplay was big to me yeah and i am not saying that that he is uh you know after the the near drowning experience that he is without fault and is mm -hmm. a perfect angelic character but but he did feel like a paternal good guy character to me at gotcha. that point on um i i do think that he is open to criticism for putting that much emotional weight on his 11 year old charge mm -hmm. you know like mm -hmm. that's that's not that's a heavy thing to tell an 11 year old you are my redemption yes uh, you know i'm putting everything on you like that's yeah, okay that, that's not that's yeah. not a kind thing to do to a kid you know so yeah. but i i guess no I, my I point has been made. i get you what ryan you, you look like you're dying to say something about humbert humbert um, oh yes definitely uh <laughs> All my deep real, studies into Humber. Real Humber. Nabokov head over here. Yeah. <laughs> no, I, I don't think the the two that you the two things you guys have both been, been discussing are mutually exclusive. Uh, he can be a very paternal character and still be. Uh, it came from a predatory, abusive place yeah. to start with, mm -hmm. um, and I think that's, for me, that's the biggest problem with this relationship and dealing with those feelings in there. It may not necessarily be explicitly that he was uh, that he was a sexual predator or anything like that, but it is her complete devotion to him that she develops a kind of Stockholm syndrome esque. Yeah. Of what's going on with this, that you go, okay, if he wants to, he's put her in a place where he could do that. Yes. And we see the, the you know, we're putting we're uh, dread in our own minds of what the worst could be. Mm -hmm. 
for him to then turn around and be the paternal, uh, a more paternal character whose love for her is different. Uh, I still don't know that I can say in good conscience in my heart, Shafa is a good guy. <laughs> sure. I can say Shafa did good things. Yeah. In the end there. Uh, but the way that he went about everything is very much abusive. It's a very uh, toxic relationship that they have at the beginning. And she's so far mired into it by the time he changes that I don't know that I trust her connection to him to be healthy either. Oh, no. No. Oh, no. no. She's... No, she's. No. I. Th- uh, there's actually a passage that I did not particularly care for. Um, gosh, it's, it's like... It's in the coda. I know I pointed this out to Sarah. Mm-hmm. Um, and uh, it's going to take me too long to find it. Um, but it's, um, she does this thing, Jemison does this thing where she, um, puts an entire paragraph in, uh, parentheses okay. a- as an aside. And I, 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 I find her pro style, even though like we've been talking about this earlier and maybe it didn't hit me the same way, but I think she's brilliant. Um, I think just as a, as a line writer, she is awesome. But one of the things that she has a tendency to do tendency of doing whatever is to do the give you these little asides as a a way to make sure that she drills into you exactly what she wants you to know about this character and their state of mind and so um so uh oh you know what i actually know exactly where it is it's at the beginning of the the second to last chapter when they're all showing up um it's uh chapter 13 nasan and esun on the dark side of the world um She's made her decision. She's going up to, to crash the moon into the earth. Um, she, so a, after a few days, she's dragged the moon into a, a, a collision course. It'll take a few days for the earth to be smashed apart. Um, so that's the, the scene setting. And then we get a whole paragraph in parentheses that says, she is such a good child at her core. Don't be angry with her. She can only make choices within the limited set of her experiences. And it isn't her fault that so many of those experiences have been terrible. Marvel instead at how easily how easily she loves, how thoroughly. Love enough to change the world. She learned to, she learned how to love like this from somewhere. And, you know, I, I didn't like that just because it's like, yeah, I know, you've been telling me that for two books. Like, I, I got it. Um, hmm. Before we ever got here. And so I, I, I didn't, didn't like the um, telling instead of, or the telling after showing. <laughs> right Maybe. not trusting you to exactly get it. i yeah there are so many things in this book that i wasn't getting but it's like no i got that one <laughs> didn't need to i didn't need that this one. yeah yeah uh, but she does that pretty frequently throughout the book interesting i did i hadn't i hadn't thought of it the way you just approached that uh in my mind i've taken i'd like this is hoa speaking to stone eater Esun right yeah. in this moment and seeing a reaction from her because you've just been talking about you know your daughter and giving feeding her back her mm-hmm. old life a little bit and and then tell you that. so I get as a as a reader on those things, but to me it makes a very it's it's a very uh, loving gesture from Hoa to say it's your daughter, but I know you're upset by this. Hold on, right? Yeah. Realize realize the good that you did in this scenario in teaching her to love, or that she learned to love. Like this capacity that she had came from somewhere. Mm-hmm. So yeah, is it redundant to the reader? Yes, but in a narrative view, I didn't have a problem with that. Yeah, yeah, I think. Um, in that case, it probably just comes down to uh, what we were talking about earlier, where she puts a ton of her herself, her own views, her own feelings into the books. Oh, yeah. Um, Death of the author isn't a thing that she's going to allow to happen to her. No, 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 <laughs> no. Yeah, these books are inseparable from her and who she is, right? As far as I can tell, uh, just because so much of that stuff is at the forefront. Um, and so because of that, um, I, I'm not ready to say that that makes it a lesser work a- at all. Um, it's different than what I generally prefer. Um, but because of that, I couldn't stop hearing her mm-hmm. through all three books, mm-hmm. right? I, I, can't, um, I, I can't completely give up and just sink into the narrative explanations that you're talking about, which I, I think that's totally legit. Mm-hmm. So during that parenthetical paragraph, you... You felt like that was Jemison talking to you as opposed to Hoa talking to Essen. Right. I mean, both. I just okay. can't, I can't lose the one. Mm, I see. If that, if that makes any sense. So. I got you. Um, okay. Gosh. Uh, we've got a few more comments to go through, but they're all for the full series discussion. Gotcha. 
Um, and so I'll kick it to you guys for any final thoughts that we want to go through uh, for the Stone Sky specifically. I, I'm sure there are things that people will wish that we had talked about, and there'll mm-hmm. be another episode. So if if, uh, if we really let you down, you can hit me up on Twitter, go to Discord, whatever. Uh, yeah, Sarah, you got I something? have two things to share that are both really small. I mentioned earlier Demeter and Persephone. Oh, yeah. There was just this one part where I was like, Demeter Persephone story. It was very. It <laughs> you was, might have to explain ah. who they are. Okay, to, well, for those who don't know. So Greek myth, uh, Demeter is the goddess of the harvest. She's one of the Olympians. Her daughter is Persephone, and Hades, god of the underworld. Uh, as the story goes, Hades kidnaps Persephone, takes her to the underworld to become his queen, basically. Um, and but Demeter doesn't know where her daughter is, um, and when she does find out, she can't get her back. Demeter wanders the earth that and the earth is barren because she's mourning the loss of her child and so the story is like oh that's why in the winter like things don't grow Demeter's so sad because Persephone's gone Persephone has to spend a a part of every year in the underworld because that's the deal struck with Hades but anyway great musical Hades town Hades town oh yeah it's fantastic okay all right and so there's this one part here um I don't remember the context. It's on page 139. In the end, they make it, which is good, because otherwise this would become the t- become the straightforward tale of you learning that your daughter is dead and letting the world wither in your grief. Anyway, it just okay. really yeah. stood out to me. Then the other thing I wanted to say, page 154, here is my literal note. There are bras in this world. <laughs> she talks about basically you know you know ryan i didn't pick up on that or didn't uh didn't really care that much not something that uh, stood out to me in my read either <laughs> it's just funny to me like it you know i it it literally like took me out of the story it's funny the things you assume i had assumed in this crazy hellscape of a world they wouldn't be wearing bras anymore they don't wear them in space that, <laughs> but that wasn't the case uh she basically said uh, so Ho, her her left breast, I think, turns to stone. Hoa eats it, and then which and she says three bites. Uh, it takes him to eat the breast that Nasan liked best. You're perversely proud to feed someone else with it. And then in, a little while later, she's getting dressed again, and she like stuffs that side of her bra. Mm. And I was like, Why are you wearing a bra? <laughs> this is terrible. <laughs> That's all. I just had to remark on that point. You know. I know there's lots of different feelings in the world about bras. Maybe other people could weigh in on why this is so important. But I, to me, it felt like when you see <laughs> Wonder Woman running around in high-heeled boots. All right. Like, why are you running in high-heeled boots? It's just not practical. <laughs> so, <laughs> okay. All right. That's all. Uh, <laughs> and, th- and that has been Sarah's Corner. <laughs> <laughs> So I will... Uh, I'll bring up my tiny little thing. I saved this for the end because it's so... It's so little. Uh, every author has ticks and quirks, right? We talk about this all the time when we talk about different series. So Robert Jordan's characters are constantly folding their arms under their breasts and, you know, whatever. Uh, what, Sanderson's characters raise eyebrows constantly. Like, they're never okay. not raising an eyebrow, uh, especially in the early books, if I recall the tick correctly. But anyway, in this one, it's the word quiescent. Oh, Really? Oh my gosh. I haven't done it yet, but I'm going to go into my Kindle editions and just search the word quiescent <laughs> and find out how many dozens of times she uses it or its variations throughout these books. Totally miss that. Constantly. Hmm. And it, the the little editor part of my brain, you know, it, it takes a little bit to activate it again. Uh-huh. But when it's activated, like it, things start to just like <laughs> claw into my brain i'm like if i read the word quiescent one more there it is again no yeah. it's constant i don't know um so there you go i don't know I, I guess i'm putting it out there to see if anybody else noticed that tick she had a few words that were uh that were definitely um you know favorites but that uh-huh. one in particular was egregious interesting so ryan you got any final thoughts um Just a quick parting shot to all of our secondary and tertiary characters in this series that, honestly, we've never really discussed much Mm. because... Yeah. Because why would you when when they're standing next to Essen and Nassen? 
the the narrative doesn't really give you a, a lot to there, but there the relationships that Esun uh, has, especially Esun has with with like Ika, yeah, mm-hmm. uh, Yika especially is I think one of the better ones. To, it's a more unique and interesting relationship. Tonki, mm. um, going back to book one, uh, book one, Pirate Lord, Eerie. Yeah, um, yeah. There's, there's and, a and lot of one. a lot of fun characters that you could you could do an entire discussion of just about her relationship and her growth arc from Alabaster and being sent to breed with him through all the relationships she goes through to the point where she's at the very end, putting her in a position where she's finally able to actually learn about being part of a bigger group because she's all about survival for the longest time. And Yika brings that up to her like, when are you going to start calling us, you know, th- you know, we, our com, your com, you know, be a part of mm-hmm. something. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And each person gives her something so that when it gets to the point where she's there fighting against Nasun for control over the obelisk gate, she's finally able to go, no, I have to be, I have to let her win and be a part of something bigger here and trust this. Yeah. And that whole arc is all made up of those secondary characters. Mm-hmm. Yeah. You can view it from Nas- from Esun's side, but just a quick shout out to all those, all those people who we've just breezed over. Yeah. Nice, <laughs> nicely done. No, I, I appreciate that. That's, that's good to remember. Um, because I didn't form a relationship with any of them. I could mm-hmm. barely tell the difference between, you know, Yika and Lerna, <laughs> you know, like, okay, mm-hmm. no, that's not quite true, but you know what I mean? Yeah. Um, it was, it was tough for me to keep track. What about you, sir? Oh, for sure. Yeah. yeah. And I, and I, I w- was bummed by that because I, I could tell there was something there, but it just, I didn't have the brain space to keep track of it. Um, as I was trying to understand the magic and understand you know, where this was all headed and everything. Yeah, so. there's a, a moment at the very end when she's on her way to Core Point. Ho is going to take her, and he says, hey, I can take anybody you want. Mm-hmm. You know, it's not just you. And she, she's like, oh, geez. And then everybody shows up to go with her, and it's this heartwarming moment. Um, and I got the emotion behind yeah. it. I got what she was trying to convey but more intellectually right because i didn't feel like it was as emotionally earned as i might have liked for it to be with mm-hmm. those side characters um yeah. but that's that's where i kind of ended up with them yeah it's a that specific section actually has a really good growth point and interesting payoff uh when they get to the other side and lerna has been taken mm-hmm. by one of the stone eaters that was attacking them in the, the corner mm, the yeah oh yeah and she comes out and goes oh yeah the man who was the husband of my unborn child, uh, you know, my my new husband, I guess. Right. And, and he's gone. And, okay, still got to go do what I got to go do. It's like... Yeah. Mm-hmm. But this woman loses husbands the way she loses limbs at a certain point. That's true. Man. I do, really, really quick, <laughs> I very much appreciate <laughs> the death clock timer, whatever you want to call it, on our hero using her magic. Oh yeah, every, the, it's like the taint of Sidene or anything like that. Where <laughs> right. Every time she uses it, the another part goes stone, and she be she ends up gone. Yeah. Right. You know, we saw it happen with Alabaster. We knew it was likely to happen with her, but in this book especially, every time they go through something, she's like, "Can't do anything. Otherwise, I'll just turn to stone right here." Right. Mm-hmm. So it's no more no more Superman to come in and take care of uh, not Darkseid, whatever his name is. Yeah, I don't, I don't care. Darkseid uh, is correct, but. No, it's his... Steppenwolf. Steppenwolf, yeah, that's the one I was thinking of. Um, yeah, Sarah, this is uh, important. We need to remember Batman versus Superman or whatever. It is. Justice, Justice League. League. Yeah, see, I even yeah, remember the name really of the movie. Yeah, that's really important. Um, okay, so as we as we wrap up, um, I will say, I know that um, after our Obelisk Gate episode, a lot of people were upset. They thought I was being too flippant about, you know, like with my... Um, did it my, deserve the Hugo thing? No. Well, yeah, there was that, or like I was being too flippant with my um, nothing with, happened with my synopsis. Mm-hmm. Yeah. yeah. Uh, it, apparently, these people don't realize that flippant is my default mode, <laughs> and I just want to say I freaking love these books. I have my complaints, and it did it. I did have a rough time with some motivation in the second and the beginning of the third book, uh, but I thought they were very, very good. Um, so I, I wanted to end with that, you know, before we get into the discussion next time about the full series, yeah. um, that I thought it was extremely well done. Um, and I, I'll just say, like, now that I, okay, I've got all three books under my belt, I at least have something of an idea of what they're about. Mm-hmm. 
And I would say that uh, the second and third book are very, very good. The first book is absolute genius. Um, that's one of the reasons I was asking about, you know, maybe did the second and third books need more time? Mm. And because I'm guessing she spent more time with the first book, especially with the way that she structured it and the different different points of view and all yeah. that. Like, um, it, it was just immaculate, I thought. Hmm. And these second two books didn't reach that for me. Gotcha. But I, I still think they were really good. So what about you guys? Um, uh, the series as a whole, do you like it? Are you going to recommend it? Ryan, you kind of got at this earlier. Yeah, I still hold my recommendation that there are those who will not appreciate this series and those who will really love it. And uh, long term, we will talk again in full series thing. I think that this is going to be a banner book that some people will some people will fly this book as a banner to, to follow oh they already do yeah so. we yeah we saw this uh, after my flippancy in, in our second episode but, right um yeah sarah um i intend to reread maybe i'll be able to do it before our next uh our next talk i'm not sure with the timing as far as recommend it i i don't know i don't know how often people in my life would be open to a recommendation to read a trilogy you yeah. know it's 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 an investment yeah you know um but certainly if somebody was like you know i'm thinking of reading these books i'd be like i i really really enjoyed them yeah you know so it comes down to an audience like who who is the person in front of you can you recommend it to them in good faith um i can't think of many people that i that i'm talking about books with who would be eager to read something like this right but um you know obviously huge readership overall i just don't happen to know those people i don't think <laughs> yeah i think i would uh, ryan you're talking about um somebody being ideologically disposed toward a book like this um i would push back and say uh if you're if you're not ideologically disposed toward a book like this then you absolutely should read this book um if only just to give you something to think about i know it gave mm -hmm. me a lot to think about um, I think I would be less likely to recommend it to somebody who I thought was stylistically opposed mm. um, and couldn't make it through her style. Um, so that, that, that's kind of where I land on that, if you're, if you're okay with it. <laughs> <laughs> I grant my approval. I Thank see you. Yes, right. that idea. Fine. If that's what you want to do, it's okay with Ryan. <laughs> all right. Well, let's call it there. I have no idea how long it's gone, but I think it's been a long time. Yeah, I think um, you're right. Sarah, I know you got... You got uh, not mad, but frustrated that we didn't give enough time to one of these episodes. Did you feel satisfied today? Oh yeah, no, I felt okay. fine with all of them. It's just frustrating, <laughs> you know, when you when when you get to the end of a conversation, then you're like, dang it, there were like 14 things that I thought were really important, and I didn't bring up any of them. <laughs> That's a personal failing more than anything. Uh, no, so thank you everybody for sticking with us. If you've stuck with us for this long, um, then now I'll do our housekeeping. Please um, go to uh, Discord. Go to thelegendarium.com. That's what I should just tell people now. Go to thelegendarium.com. Uh, you can find links to Patreon. Thank you so much. We've had a surge of uh, patrons come up, and I really, really appreciate that. That's fantastic. Um, so you can find Patreon there. There's also, if you go to the support button, somebody was asking about this today on Discord, um, there is a one-time donation button for PayPal. So you can do that. If you prefer not to set up a recurring $1 tip jar donation, then you can do a one-time thing, and that's just as appreciated. Uh, so those are there. The link to the Discord is there. We are, uh, we're at like 900 members. So we're pushing 1,000 members in the Discord, and it has remained... A wonderful, delightful, friendly, uh, spoiler-free, all the all the nice things. Place. <laughs> uh, so I, I cannot recommend it highly enough. Please go there. There are uh, there are 900 people there. Many of them are lurkers, but there are dozens, possibly a hundred or more people who are ready to chat with you and welcome you with open arms. And so I, I hope I see lots of you there. Um, all right, shall we? Yeah. Uh, we will do another one of these. It'll be a full episode wrap up. Um, we'll talk through the whole the whole trilogy and our thoughts on it, how it all works together, and um, answer as many listener questions as we can. And so I'll see you guys there. Bye.